Okay, welcome back, everybody here in Kelvin Grove. Welcome back, crew on Zoom, for uh, our last session of this part of the symposium, the session on, uh, what's the title of it? Search Personalization and Polarization. So a little bit different from some of the previous sessions, we're going to have two slightly longer presentations and then a, a bit of discussion. I need to introduce Matthias, so I actually need to have his bio in front of me. Sorry about this, everyone. Hi, Matthias. Welcome. I'm just opening a Google Doc, if anyone would like to tap dance while I'm doing that. Not me. Okay. So we're really pleased to be able to welcome to speak with you this afternoon, Matthias Spielkamp from our partner organization, Algorithm Watch in Germany. Matthias is co-founder and executive director of that organization. Uh, he's testified before major European uh, government committees and is a membership, member of the Global Partnership on AI. He serves on the governing board of the German section of Reporters Without Borders, the advisory council of Stiftung Warentest and the Whistleblower Network and the expert committee on communication information of Germany's UNESCO commission, among many other things. So as you can hear, Matthias is really committed to making a major difference in the policy and regulatory environment surrounding algorithms and AI in the European context. Uh, we're very pleased to be collaborating with him on our search engine um, personalization project. And Matthias, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can you give me a sign whether you can hear me okay? We can hear you. Okay, great. And now the next challenge will be to share my presentation. And it's really an odd feeling to be presenting, you know, from several thousand miles away to actually a room full of people. Now, uh, that's a change. So let me find my presentation. Here we go. Now, I hope everyone can see that. Okay, so the touching the platform's party, data donations between self-defense and acts of desperation. And I hope it will become clear while I chose that title. So Algorithm Watch is an organization, a civil society, non-profit organization. And we say that we watch, unpack, and explain the of algorithmic systems on justice, fairness, equality, individual autonomy, and the public good. Um, we call out misuse and advocate for the benevolent application of these algorithmic systems because they must be used to benefit the many, not the few. That's trying to do uh, to put um, many things that we are active on in a nutshell. And I'll pick out one specific application today um, that overlaps or um, um, works towards our goal of ADM systems that benefits individuals and society. Uh, because we do focus also on platform governance. And here the question of course is, how can we make platforms more accountable while at the same time protect users' rights and collective interests? Because there are a lot of rights affected here, not just individual ones, but also those of society. Um, so we said, let's find out what their algorithms do. I mean, the platform's algorithms. And we created this idea of what we call data donations. And um, start with an example. The first data donation that we did as an organization was in 2017, and it was funded by state media authorities in Germany um, who are overseeing um, first and foremost, traditional broadcast media, radio and TV, um, but are of course more getting into um, the field of online and online platforms. They were looking at uh, podcasts and web TV and such things. And of course, you know, there was the, um, yeah, not the idea, but the necessity that they were also thinking about um, if we are a regulatory authority or authorities, um, how, how can we deal with the online space? And we also collaborated with the Technical University of Kaiserslautern in that project. Now, what what did we do? We produced a plugin or an add-on 
Google Chrome and Firefox that people were asked to install on their computers. Um, and this plugin would then send search requests to Google. Um, it was the run-up to the German federal elections four years ago. So, I mean, it was basically taking place exactly four years ago. And we asked the plugin to search for or to send as a query to Google these um, search terms. You may recognize some of them like Angela Merkel, and you probably don't recognize others like Cem Özdemir or Alice Weidel. Uh, because they are not so internationally known, but you can see that this is these are names of politicians who were running for election and also the parties that they um, that, that were the most um, popular parties at the time. And how did we um, get enough donors? We collaborated with mainstream media, in this case, Der Spiegel in Germany, which is also online, one of the most popular news outlets. And they wrote an article about this and said, please support this campaign, download that plugin and start donating your data. Because all the stuff that they collected, the users collected on their computers via the plugin was then sent over to us to analyze. So we had almost 4,000 donors. In the end, it was only about 1,500 of uh, whose data was then usable for us, but it still added up to more than 8 million data sets that were available for us to analyze or for the colleagues at uh, Technical University of Kaiserslautern. And the results were that, uh, oh, <laughs> I forgot to tell you what we were looking into. Um, by sending all these queries to Google, and analyzing the results, we wanted to find out what the level of personalization was that Google was trying to achieve or uh, that, that Google was doing with these search results. And we found out that on average, between one and two of these so-called organic results differ between users. I don't know whether in this community I need to explain what organic is. I dislike the word because there's, of course, nothing organic about this, but this is what um, it is called in the search engine business when you have um, search results that are not promoted for advertising reasons that are paid for and things like that, that um, Google argues are just sorted um, um, by relevance. And only between one and two or uh, many you know, um, um, of these search results uh, differed between users, but of course they didn't differ, or not of course, but um, they didn't differ in a way that, for example, in one case, they were on um, uh, spot number one and the other one on spot number 10, it was rather, you know, was it number three or number four, something like that. And of course, then the question with these results is, is this a lot? Is that little? And, uh, you know, if these search results differ, what difference does it make? And I have to tell you, and this is something that we'll discuss later, that um, we don't have too many good answers to this because the entire universe of assessing what this means is a little more complex than just finding out which is complex enough how they differ in the ranking on google now um, there is an english language publication on this so for those of you who are interested in the details of this experiment uh, you can look it up uh, under this link and of course i'll share the presentation with everyone who's interested after the event today. Um, but I focus a little on the shortcomings um, of this first experiment that, that we did. So first of all, um, it was done in a rush. Um, the money came in very late, so uh, we had to make some quick decisions. And after the fact, I'd say we did not have a good choice of search terms because they were too generic. We should have used something that is more um, contested like uh, immigration or uh, old age pension funds and things like that. Um, also, the problem was a sample structure because there's a certain audience for these mainstream media, especially Spiegel and their uh, internet um, section where this appeared. So it was clear. And also, you know, there are not a lot of people who would even participate in something like this. This is also a major obstacle. And again, we'll talk about this a little later. 
Also, in our experiment, there were no dynamic changes to search terms possible. So we were not really able to react to any uh, current political uh, developments during these elections, which is you know, very unfortunate, you can imagine. And we were not able to collect a lot of demographic data about um, our donors due to privacy constraints. We, uh, constraints. we had to be really, really uh, sensitive about uh, privacy. Otherwise, you know, we would have had uh, a lot of personalized data and that is highly problematic um, under the current data protection regime. And also, you know, admittedly, we had some technical glitches that made some of the um, samples or some of the donations that we received unusable for us, which means we learned a lot. Uh, and this is always good if you do an experiment like this was the first time. So we would definitely not say that this was um, a failure. Um, it was a success as a campaign and also as an experiment for ourselves. But the results and what you can draw from them is are quite limited. Um, ideally, we think there could be a permanent representative user panel that is using such a technology established with the option to quickly change search terms. So you could do a permanent monitoring and react to political um, developments and then see what happens. And that I th we think would tell us more than the experiment that we did. Or you can also change the law and increase the transparency of ADM systems. I mean, I don't need to explain again in this community what ADM means, the entire center uh, is, is called like that. But uh, usually, you know, people talk about AI and um, uh, algorithms. But uh, of course, we are talking about automated decision making systems here at Algorithm Watch ourselves. So what we wanted is that the lawmaker introduce legally binding data access frameworks to support and enable public interest research by academics, journalists, and civil society organizations. And this is why, uh, and, and also develop and establish approaches to effectively audit such algorithmic systems. And this is why we started a, a project that is called the Governing Platforms Project. It is in a sense uh, ongoing. Um, in the first leg of it, which took about 18 months, we had a lot of uh, a couple of uh, scientific studies done on media and communications on law um, and also on practical implications and we published in the end the um, position paper putting meaningful transparency at the heart of the digital services act which is the ongoing legislative uh, in the european union why data access for research matters and how we can make it happen and this was signed by a lot of international renowned academics some uh, also here at the center and a lot of civil society organizations and what we had margaret Vestag, the um Vice President of the European Union and in charge of uh, the platforms and the DSA um, gave a keynote speech at our closing event and basically put forward a lot of similar demands. And in the end, this resulted in the Article 31 of the Data uh, of the Digital Services Act on data access and scrutiny. So we would say this was quite a success, not our own only. Uh, because there were many other organizations and academics asking for the same thing, but uh, we do think that we were part of it. And of course, you know, we were able to use these real life scenarios of the data donation projects to tell people that it's not enough to look at these from the outside, uh, at these systems from the outside. Meanwhile, we were already conducting a new experiment. We got some monitoring of Instagram where we did something similar, a similar uh, donation with people uh, looking at their Instagram feeds, collecting data from their Instagram, Instagram feeds and handing them over to us. Um, and we produced a couple of interesting stories. The first one was picked up internationally. Um, it was called Undress or Fail, Instagram's algorithm strong arms users into showing skin, where we said that there are quite some clear indications for the fact that um, the Instagram algorithm doesn't just use people's preferences, but has its own preference in a sense, or of course the company has a preference in promoting uh, images with, uh, you know, um, people showing a lot of skins, uh, skin, um, women in bikinis, men with bare chests, 
um, and by that trying to you know improve the engagement on the platform and that was picked up quite widely we then changed um, focus onto politics in the Dutch election um, and the first time that we found that political posts that posted by politicians were doing a lot less well on Instagram than stuff that you know just during their doing uh, going about their hobbies or um, being together with their families or things like that. Now, Facebook's reaction to that was that we reviewed Algorithm Watch's report and found a number of issues with the methodology. Report fundamentally misunderstands how we work. But despite of all this, we go even further to deeply study algorithms and work with academics and other to help keep bias out of them. Yeah, sure you do. Um, and we continued our experiment with a last one in Germany that we did in collaboration with Süddeutsche Zeitung, which is one of the major newspapers and news outlets in Germany. Um, and we had a similar approach to the one in the Netherlands. So we again collected the posts of certain politicians and wanted to analyze those with the partners at uh, the media company. And then we received a message from Facebook and it says, we really request that you take the steps to address this issue to ensure compliance with our terms. Remove the extension download from your website and Chrome store. Stop collecting data by deactivating the installed extensions and delete the data you've obtained via extension. And we must ask that you take these steps or you may be subject to additional enforcement action. And um, honestly, at that time, it was in the middle of the summer. I was on vacation. Nicolas, who did the experiment, was on parental leave. We said, okay, so we give in, you know, we're not going to go up against Facebook in court. Um, weighed our options and said, um, we'll comply, but, and that was then also in connection with the NYU ad observatory case, where we did something similar to researchers in the United States who had already received a cease and desist letter. Um, and in that case, threatened again with legal action, just disabled access to these uh, researchers. Um, on their platform and the tool they used. And they, they did this for privacy reasons. And then the FTC weighed in, you know what? You know, very rare case that they published an open statement and said, you know what? It's not true, you know? <laughs> we didn't ask Facebook to do this. Um, and it's not to comply with privacy. I actually, we or we, we support this public uh, interest research. And this is then when we decided to go public with our case and say, you know what, this doesn't only happen in the United States. It happens in Europe as well. Um, and we went public. And there was a lot of media coverage about this. And we started an open letter asking that platforms must stop suppress public interest research. So um, what uh, we did before, um, asking the government to um, enhance the data access from Article 31 to protect research about digital platforms. And it was signed in the end by more than 6,000 people. So uh, again, that was quite a success. Um, at the moment, we are receiving a lot of calls from the European Parliament, from the European Commission, from uh, member state countries. So hopefully we can turn this into a success after all, at least on the policy making front. And if you're interested in the results of what we found out with the uh, Instagram monitoring in Germany for editions, we have a English language summary of that. And we also did uh, in parallel one on YouTube with a different methodology, a different uh, technical tool that is called uh, Datascope. Um, and we also have results, first results from this as well, more coming up. And I went a little over time. I hope that's not too bad. If you would like to keep up with what we're doing, we have a newsletter that you can subscribe to. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Matthias. I'm not going to reintroduce Professor Axel Bruns, but I'm just going to remind you to please be putting your questions, comments into the Slido app as we, as we go along so that uh, hopefully we'll have time for, for a few of them at least. Axel?
Fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you, Matthias. It was great to hear from you and uh, to see this work. Thank you for fighting the good fight on behalf of all of us. Um, we like the project that um, Algorithm Watch did in 2017 that Matthias has just talked about so much that we wanted to do our own version of this as part of ADMS. Um, and that's what we're doing. That's what we've started. Um, so again, the, the key questions here are whether and to what extent search results are personalized and in what way. Uh, of course, there are concerns that always are raised around this about information inequality, about uh, filter bubbles. Um, and uh, beyond and building on what Matthias has already said, we're also quite interested in how results change over time and to what extent they react to, of course, what's going on in the world and uh, perhaps on emerging topics, is there a period where there's poorer quality results being served before they standardize in some way. So these are all areas of interest for our version of this project. Um, what we did uh, with our version of the project, the Australian Search Experience, was to extend the number of platforms that we cover, Google Search, Google News, Google Video, and YouTube. Um, we are still very much taking the approach that Algorithm Watch took, which is basically to uh, ask users to install a browser plugin. You might have seen a couple of months ago, particularly the media campaign that we ran essentially. We had interviews and pieces in various Australian media outlets to encourage people to install this plugin for Google Chrome, um, Opera, and Edge, uh, and Firefox. Um, and uh, yeah, we launched this in late July, and uh, these are the people from the center who are involved. If you're interested, if you want to get involved, you want to install the plugin yourselves, then this is the URL um, to go to admscenter.org.au slash search experience. If you go there, that's where it looks like. Um, as of now, we have uh, nearly a thousand uh, users who've installed the plugin. Um, together, they've donated some astronomical number of search results. Um, uh, so this is uh, the, the number of search data sets that Matthias was talking about, but multiplied by the number of results that are in it. That's why it's a lot larger than the 8 million, I think, that Matthias talked about. Um, and uh, yes, as the browsers install, as the plugins install, this is what will pop up from time to time. It will run its searches, basically piggybacking on, onto the, the user's uh, profile with these platforms, uh, running searches as if the user was running them, and then reporting the results back to our server. Um, we also do ask for some basic demographics from users as they install the plugin. Again, very, very limited and very generic demographics because also while we're not covered by the GDPR, we certainly don't want to ask for any information that uh, is problematic in any way. And this is at the moment what our distributions uh, for participants are looking like. Um, so uh, a reasonably good distribution across a number of fields, I think, uh, where I'd say we still have um, significant imbalances is on gender. We've got about twice as many males as females, men as women. Um, we have uh, a, a great imbalance towards the eastern states, particularly towards Queensland at this point in terms of participants. Um, we have, as far as party preferences go, also some imbalance. We have, um, you know, a, a good number of conservatives as well as progressive uh, voters, but uh, the Greens are overrepresented um, here. Uh, so this doesn't match, obviously, voting intentions in Australia at this point. Um, but in many other fields, I think we we actually have a reasonably good uh, distribution already, which is promising. But um, with the number of users that we have participating at this point, I don't want to push this too far yet. We certainly want to continue to increase and replenish our, our user base as well, because we expect there to be attrition, obviously, over time as well. But this, just to, for background to what I'm going to show you now, which is some of the preliminary results from this project, um, uh, might be useful to, to explain uh, some of what we see as well. So I'm going to take you through two, again, very preliminary metrics that we've developed for this. Um, which build a little bit on what Matthias has talked about with the analysis that they've done in, in their um, publications from their project, but also extend this a little bit further. Um, uh, so the first question is really, what are the search rankings over time for any one search? So if you're searching for a particular topic, what do you see? How does that change from day to day? We could go to hour to hour or whatever as well, but for the moment, let's just say from day to day. Um, uh, and what, how might that be different across different demographics or other aspects of our user base as well. For now, I'm talking only about organic results, again, as Matthias also did, although we are also capturing 
promoted results. Uh, people also searched for these things, boxes and various other things. But uh, let me just limit it to organic results for, for now. Um, and uh, again, with the limitations of our demographics as well. And we can extend this further down the track, looking at you know, other units of time, uh, looking at other forms of variations and so on. But um, for now, let's just do this um, uh, so I can give you some ideas. Now, rather than going through how we calculate this metric, uh, which uh, is based on the idea of rank flow, I'll, I'll just, I think, visualize that for you in a second. Um, and, uh, of course, down the track, what we're also interested in is breaking this da down further into demographic distinctions and into, into different browsers. Uh, the question came up this morning whether the browser platforms may have an, in uh, an impact as well. But essentially, this is what this metric looks like. And I'll just step you through what you're seeing here. So this is for a particular keyword. In this case, our illustrious Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce. So if you're searching for the name Barnaby Joyce, um, uh, these are the results that you end up seeing. Um, now, um, every line here represents a distinct search result, a distinct URL that, uh, that Google, in this case, provides. Um, uh, so that's, that's what they are. Um, the uh, URLs are ranked, in this case, simply by how, on average, they appear in the list. So the, the, list, the, the line that's usually at the top is usually the top-ranked URL and certainly was on that day. Um, uh, the line thickness indicates how much variation there is. The thinner the line, the, the more stable the result. Um, so further down, you see more variation in this case. Uh, if there's a single dot, then that result only appeared on that day. That might, might have been a news story that appeared and then disappeared again because Barnaby said something on TV. Um, and uh, the longer the overall list is for each of these days, the more variation there is actually in search results. Uh, we're looking here only really at the first page of search results, which normally contains nine results. So if you're seeing nine results, then these were basically everything that everyone saw. If you're seeing 12 or, or more results, then there was a lot more variation, and they all appeared for some significant group of our users. So that's the overall kind of logic of what I'm showing you here. And to make this a bit more complicated now, we're looking at it for Google Search, Google News, Google Video, and YouTube. And in, in this particular case, we're looking at the search term Uluru Statement. And you see there that for Google Search, for Google Video, the results are really quite stable over time. There's some fluctuation, but broadly the, the same terms appear very much at the top for all of them. For Google News even, there's also still some stability, although we would expect news to be more fast moving. And for YouTube, well, the, the top results are actually very stable as well, but below that, it's basically a kid's drawing. Um, so it goes all over the place, although it might stabilize again somewhere further down by the looks of it. So, um, so that's a, a, actually quite a typical result that we see in a number of cases. Um, here's Black Lives Matter, which as a fairly controversial topic internationally, we might expect there to be some more contestation, but again, for search, for video, very stable. Um, for YouTube, at the top, quite stable, and then a lot more fluctuation. For news, more jumping about, and often you see this where it starts at the top and then drops off, and that's, that's the typical behavior, I think, of news stories, quite simply. They appear on a day, and then the next day, there's something else that's in the news, perhaps around these topics. Um, breaking this down, interestingly enough, uh, the device question comes in. We do see some variations there per device, whether it's on desktop or mobile devices. And I should say, we, we can't install the plugin itself on mobile devices, but we can spoof the appearance of a mobile device so that Google thinks this search is being made from a mobile device, although it's our browser plugin doing it on a desktop computer. And we do see there some, some distinctions between desktop and mobile devices, in part just because a different version of a platform is being search, served so the, in, the English language Wikipedia desktop version versus mobile version, for instance. But we do see some other fluctuations that are interesting and that we still need to explain. Um, critical race theory, another controversial topic, um, which again you see there on search and video actually quite stable. Um, on news, uh, a lot of stuff that appears and then disappears the next day. And on YouTube, it's, it really is kind of all over the place. Um, and that's, to me, quite interesting, particularly actually the distinction here between YouTube and Google Video, which in theory are both video platforms run by Google, but clearly designed differently. Google Video appears to be designed more to simply surface whatever the most appropriate result is for a particular topic. Google Video is, of course, designed to make it to be sticky, to keep you there. So perhaps from this, I'm... I'm uh, 
suggesting that there might be much stronger personalization there based on who you are and, 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 and who you're interested in. Um, and you see there the lines on, for YouTube are also much thicker, which means much more variation ultimately in the results. Just moving on, I'm just giving you this just to give you a few examples here. This is the search term COVID. Um, and you see some very different behaviors there. Um, for Google search, top results are pretty much always the same. Below that, a lot more variation. Um, Google uh, News, basically new results every day, which in the midst of a pandemic is actually perhaps the expected behavior as well. Many of these news links actually will link to live blogs and the latest releases of infection figures and so on. Uh, YouTube there too, you see stuff appear and then disappear the next day. Again, partly because YouTube for this keyword serves a lot of news video content as well. And Google Video again is, is slightly different, but also very centric on news videos that are relevant on one day and then disappear the next. Um, so these are the sorts of variations that we see. Now here I'm, I'm breaking down Google search also per state because for search that actually explains a lot of the variation. Google search for the keyword COVID is very strongly personalized by location. Um, that's something we're seeing already. So if you're searching from Queensland, you get Queensland health advice. If you're searching for New South Wales, you get New South Wales health advice and so on. Um, and that actually is a very significant factor here in the personalization that we see. Um, per state, there's still quite a lot of variation going on, but it's actually, there, there's much more stability still compared to the, the national uh, aggregated results. So. Um, uh, there is, by looks also, quite a lot of curation going on here of the results. In fact, one thing to say with COVID is particularly, if you search for COVID, yes, there are some organic search results on the Google search page, but there's also a lot of other stuff there that isn't so much search results as just COVID background information. Um, so uh, most users will actually have to scroll quite a bit before they even see the first organic search results on the page. Um, Compare that with vaccines, um, similar kind of story there. And again, YouTube is particularly all over the place here, but also in part because there's lots of news stories that are being served uh, by, Google, by YouTube here. Whereas, should I get vaccinated? Which is not really a very different question potentially. You see the Google search and Google video very, very stable, particularly at the top. YouTube also quite stable at the top and Google News a bit more uh, news oriented and a bit more movable. So that to us is also very interesting that something as simple as vaccine versus should I get vaccinated produces such different results in our data. Um, moving on to something entirely different, just to give you some other ideas here, this is for, for the keyword home loan, which is just incredibly boring, particularly in Google search, but all over the place in, in YouTube. So um, these are areas, these are observations that we haven't really had a chance to fully explain yet. Um, but uh, there's some very, very different behaviors, obviously, as you can see there. Um, however, if you search for mortgage broker, um, the story is slightly different again, um, and much more variation there in search and video as well. Uh, although, again, in, in terms of themes and topics, there's actually not that much difference. Mortgage broker also, by the way, breaks down very strongly by state, which home loan doesn't. Let me just very quickly go to another metric here just to give you some other um, overviews. So this here, you're interested in the intraday variability. So the, the variability in search results on the same day across all the users uh, who, who were searching during this time. Um, again, there's a bunch of limitations with, which I'll just go through quite quickly here. And how we calculate the variability, I think um, I'm, I'm not going to step through this one by one because it gets quite complicated. But again, I'll show you this on the next slide, I think, just very briefly. So if you take the search results for a particular term on a particular day, you see here on, on uh, the first column, these are the actual URLs that we see in our data, in our data for that search result on that day. We've ordered them here by volume, um, and this is for uh, people who saw a, a list length of nine, so nine results in their search. There is some variation in how many results you actually see. But if you take everyone who saw nine results in their search on that day for the term mortgage broker, these are the URLs that they found, and this is how often they appeared. In total, we've had about uh, 2,260 results. Um, we're now interested in how many of these top results it takes to get to 80% of all the results being served. You see there are very long tail distribution. So there's a, there's a lot of search results that hardly ever were encountered by any of our users. 
um, but we have a bunch of them that, that appeared very, very frequently. So in this case, we've counted back and essentially the first 31 results in our list of 250, uh, sorry, of, of 2,200 results are required to account for 80% of all search results encountered, right? So that's the calculation that we're making. We're comparing that 31 to what the ideal case would be if everyone saw the same result. So 80% of a list of nine is 7.2. So you, you would normally, if, if everyone saw exactly the same results, you'd only need 7.2 or rounded up to eight results and everyone would have seen 80% of all the results basically in our data. In this case, we're needing 31 though. So doing a bit of calculation with that on a scale from zero to one variability, that's a variability of 0.77. That's the calculation that we've made for each of these um, uh, search terms. And that's then what they look like for Google search, news, video, and YouTube. And we're seeing there per search term some very different behaviors as you can see there. So, the lockdown, vaccine, COVID, and quarantine-related results um, show quite a substantial amount of variability on news and search for some, but not all of them, on video for most of them, on YouTube uh, as well for, for quite a few of them. The results like mortgage broker, cash loan, cash advance, and home loan work very differently, oddly enough, across, uh, across the platforms, but also across these different, but ultimately very similar kind of search terms. Um, uh, searches for critical race theory, feminism, Black Lives Matter, so controversial topics um, uh, that are part of culture wars at this point, all rank very low on Google search, very little vari variation um, uh, during the day, um, higher on Google News, uh, Google Video, and YouTube. Um, and the average, actually, if, if we take the average for all of these search terms, and I need to say, obviously, that these search terms are not an even distribution across all possible searches that could be made because there's, there's no way to, to calculate this. But across the search terms that we're tracking, Google Search and Google Video have relatively limited variability um, with some out breakouts, obviously, as you can see there. Google News tends to be uh, sort of very much oriented around a, 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 a middle there. And YouTube is kind of middling as well, but again, with some very distinct bands almost in our data there in, in terms of how variable and how, how, how different the, these results are across users. So we're seeing some very different behaviors across these platforms. And that to us is a starting point towards investigating further what distinguishes these different search terms, what kind of variability we see, whether that's driven by particular demographics or any other factors that we might be able to imagine. So just to finish off then, these are the sorts of patterns that at the moment we're seeing. Google search is actually quite stable in where, where it provides. Google news is, because it's news, very fast moving. Google video is often quite static. Google uh, YouTube is often, is often stable in the first few results and then there's a lot of change and variability uh, across different users uh, down the track. So there's kind of limited evidence to a certain extent of personalization, certainly for Google search, and there it's largely driven by user location. Um, critical topics such as vaccine, COVID and so on, but also possibly some of the kind of culture war topics um, may be manually curated to a point to actually avoid some of that variability and fluctuation and avoid different people getting different results about whether they should take a vaccine or not. Um, some variation is based on browser type as well and uh, particularly YouTube is an, a really interesting case that just needs further investigation, which we'll get to uh, hopefully very soon. So that's, that's for us, these are the next steps. More, more analysis per platform, across platforms, um, more breakdown by these attributes, of course. Um, we still haven't even talked about organic results, and that's the, one of the, the non-organic results, and that's one of the other things that we want to do, of course. And of course, um, we want to see what is actually being served and whether that is of good quality or not. So beyond that, we'll, we'll continue to try and attract more users, uh, a broader demographic profile, 
uh, compensate for part participant attrition, of course. We are able to vary our search terms over time as well. We'll certainly do that when the federal election comes along um, and, uh, yeah, focus on, on particular events as they come up as well. So that hopefully gives you a reasonably good idea of where we're at at this point. There is, sorry, there's a lot of data, and for those of you who are still here in the non-public afternoon tomorrow, we have another session where we can explore that a bit further. But that hopefully gives you a bit of an idea of the, the sort of data that we're actually starting to see from this, which I think actually supports quite a few of the results that the Algorithm Watch study also showed, um, but hopefully can take this a bit further still as well. So I'll leave it there, and hopefully we'll have a bit of time for discussion still. Thank you. So thank you so much, Matthias and Axel, for uh, that deep dive into these really important projects and I suppose the broader kinds of questions they throw up, both about, um, about what the, the, the extent to which search results are not only personalised but curated and for which topics and in which ways. And, and with what drivers, external and internal drivers, I suppose. Uh, I'm not sure we have a lot of, oh, we've got a few more questions now. Um, I have a few too. I, I suppose just to pick up where you left off, Axel, um, and to go back to what Matthias was presenting about some of the, you know, the, limita the inevitable limitations of that early effort where we were looking at uh, keywords associated with an election, we're looking at Google News and so on. So not only are they kind of neutral terms, you would expect them to be like, well, election communications quite heavily monitored and regulated and other social, social or cultural topics aren't. But also it's taken a very long time, I think, for policy actors, concerned citizens to understand that YouTube is actually a pretty significant platform for communication and, you know, our colleagues at Data and Society, um, led by Dana Boyd, were talking for quite a while about the data voids that emerge around emergent controversial virtual topics. So I suppose that's all to lead into asking um, whether, in, in which bits of this work can we start to connect what you're seeing in the early results with uh, what we know platforms are actually doing in terms of their policies for intervening on uh, the curation of results and so on. So, for example, like, do we know that they are very careful about the top two results for searches? Oh. A broad question, I guess. Well, uh, I mean, yep. um, one, one encouraging point, I guess, I'd, I'd take away from the early discussion that we had also was, uh, as Mark was saying, that some of the platforms are open at least to generally talk about the, the way that they, I guess, shape their algorithms and perhaps curate their results. So having these results now, um, it might be time to start to talk to some of these platforms as well and understand, well, to what extent is there curation? Is there any, even, even in existing public statements, is there any sign that, that they might have engaged in curation, of course, of, of these results? Um, it is very obvious, uh, clearly, if you just Google for Google COVID or vaccine or whatever, that um, this isn't a normal search results page, but that there's a lot of manual labor that's gone into it. Um, but how are these pages chosen? How are these topics chosen? Um, for how long will that persist? Um, was it done with the question of vaccines, for instance, before uh, COVID, when there were already anti-vaxxers out there? Um, I think those kinds of choices and those internal policies of when to intervene, yeah, need to be further investigated. And I think uh, hopefully some of the platforms might actually be quite open to talking uh, with us about this as well. Matthias, did you have anything to contribute on, on that particular point? Well, just briefly, I think one of the... Whoa, I have a, an echo in my... <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that was irritating for a second. No, I, I don't think you can do anything about this. Um, so um, uh, the, the one thing that I, I like about this discussion and how it's going is that more people just become aware of the fact that uh, there are algorithms that are used to curate these search results because this is far from uh, common knowledge. And it's not going to be common knowledge because of the experiments that we're doing. But uh, even there, I would say there is an upshot to the conflict and the controversy about this and to uh, things like 
uh, Facebook uh, intervening and threatening researchers and so on and so forth. That's all, of course, not a good development. Um, but at the same time, it gets the entire topic more attention. And it's, it's really needed because I guess we all agree that a big part of the equation here is also that people need to understand what platforms are and how they work. Uh, and in that sense, you know, I'm, I'm an optimist. Uh, uh, I think there is, there is a change for at least uh, some good in the sense that people become more aware that what they are seeing is not some neutral objective, whatever, sorting on these platforms, but uh, that there is a lot of curation going on and it's important. Yes, Matthias, I guess I'd throw in as well as engaging the public and engaging the companies, as we've heard a bit in the previous session, people who are very actively involved as content creators and participants on these platforms are really engaged with these issues and often very knowledgeable about them, but perhaps there's a bridging piece of work around some of the technical aspects that people like, like us in our centre can provide. Uh, we have a question from Anonymous, which sounds ominous. Um, these uh, platform um, oversight projects tend to focus on the very large dominant platforms. Does this mean that perhaps there are smaller platforms that we should be uh, um, watching out for who escape our attention? Well, there, there certainly are. Um, I mean, I guess the reason that we're starting with these dominant platforms is because they're dominant. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what the current market share is, but a, a very, very substantial percentage of all searches will be done via Google in the first place. So um, it has a lot more uh, of an impact on the information environment that people live in than something much smaller, um, uh, some other platform. That doesn't mean that we should ignore these platforms, but obviously if we're interested in the extent to which these, the, the information flows and the information environment that, that we all live in is shaped by, uh, by search and recommendation algorithms, then I think starting with the, the, with the ones that are most prominent is, a, is sensible. However, if you look at particular communities or particular uh, groups that might be using other platforms predominantly, then clearly, yes, we, we should also uh, have a very close look at how they work. Matthias? And maybe, yeah, one quick comment on that as well. I think, I mean, the first obvious answer is yes. You know, the smaller ones are uh, escaping this kind of scrutiny. And uh, for example, with the um, legal uh, implications here in Europe. Uh, the draft of the uh, Digital Services Act is talking about the VLOPs, you know, the very large online platforms, and they are the only ones who are then required to do uh, things like uh, um, a systemic risk assessment and, and this stuff. You know, it doesn't apply to the smaller ones. Now, there's, of course, first of all, a very good reason for that, because it is uh, quite a substantial requirement and uh, the compliance with that is difficult and expensive and you don't want to give the large platforms another competitive advantage in the sense that, oh, yeah, we can do it. We can throw our uh, dozens of lawyers at this, but the smaller ones can't. Uh, which would be a, a consequence that no one would like to see. But then on the other hand, there is a very substantial question behind this. And for example, the, uh, the legal uh, academic, uh, Matthias Cornels, who we worked with in um, the Governing Platforms Project, has a lot of doubt about how this um, law is structured, uh, because he's exactly arguing that, you know, if there is harm done, um, there shouldn't be a difference between harm done on a small platform and harm done on a um, large platform, um, especially when you're talking about um, many smaller platforms that, uh, you know, then uh, taken together uh, can have quite an impact. Uh, but it's a conundrum, you know, it's, it's really hard to solve. And um, we need to think about um, how we can also address the smaller ones and what we can do about this. And at the same time, you know, as always, balance this with uh, freedom of expression and, and uh, assembly um, uh, requirements or law uh, rights that we also need to take uh, into account here. Uh, there's a couple of questions that I'm going to try to combine here. One uh, more simple one from, from Heather Ford, who wants to know 
which types of non-organic results will we be looking at or what might we do with those? And somewhat relatedly, uh, you also get that ancillary set of recommended searches um, users also search for. Um, what might we, we do with those? And that's from Simon. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and that's, uh, I guess, one of the things that we've really tried to do with this version of the, of the tool is to capture pretty much everything, essentially, that we see on, on the results pages when the search is done. So, yeah, if you're seeing, as for most searches, you will um, information on what people also searched for. If you're seeing side boxes that, for instance, if you search for, for a, per, a, a public figure, um, you might see a side box with, with something drawn from their Wikipedia profile or whatever else it might be, uh, or a company, you'll see the same. Um, if you're searching for a current event, you might see, you know, some other information, whatever, the Tokyo Olympics, you might have seen the, the latest medal tally or something. Um, so any, any and all of that we are capturing at this point. What we will have to do is actually sift through that and see what are typical, if there is such a thing, um, additional non-organic bits of information. Um, and of course, yeah, the, the other thing is promoted content as, as well, which, which will appear um, across a number of these platforms, not, not just in Google search. So any and all of that we've captured, we've got to sift through now and work out what we can do with that, to be honest. Um, because again, there's a lot there. A lot of it is not necessarily very standard because it differs quite significantly across search results. But even that is also interesting. When do you and when don't you get uh, the, the, the sidebar boxes? When do you and when don't you get uh, recommendations for what people also searched for. What does that tell us about some of the internal decision making um, that might be going on at these platforms that might be baked into ultimately the, the, the platform algorithms, of course, as well? I think that sort of relates to Mark's question about what are the indicators of manual mm. curation. So it strikes me to be really useful if no one's already done it, I don't know, to kind of do an anatomy of the page of search results, what you might see, where we think that comes from obviously trying not to reproduce a binary opposition between manual and automated results and so on. I don't know if you think mm. that's an interesting idea. Absolutely, I think so. And, and of course, this is not something that stands still, but that, that evolves over time as well. And uh, uh, particularly when there's major events, there might be new ways of, of doing this again that might pop up that we haven't seen before. Um, so yes, absolutely, I think that's, that's really uh, of interest. Um, one problem, of course, with, that we have with this, as we have with some of the comparisons I've shown there uh, before as well, is that we can't possibly cover the entire breadth of possible things that people might be searching for. Uh, there's, there's just too many searches and too many different searches being done. Uh, so we've, we've tried to have at least a good range of topics from the mundane to the political to the urgent to the you know, non-urgent, whatever else it might be. Um, but uh, we, and, and we can only, of course, run so many search terms as well. We, we're, we're running about 40 search terms in a, in a single session at this point, which is about as far as we can go without really bogging the user's computer down. We're also, that's one thing I should also say, we're limited, of course, also by what we can ethically run on uh, uh, someone else's computer. So we're not going to use QAnon as a search term or, you know, uh, how can I fake my vaccination certificate as a search term or something like that? Because we don't want to make it appear like this user who's very innocently come to us and said, yes, I'm donating some search results to you, now suddenly is a QAnon adherent or QAnon curious at least. So um, we have some limits to what we can search for. It would be very interesting to do a large study of what people see when they search for, for a controversial term like that. But um, we don't want to put that in user search histories, obviously. Um, so. Yeah, but we'd love to have a really good breadth of, of terms that we're searching for to answer some of those questions. Well, in what areas, in, you know, on what topics do we see this embellishment? Where don't we see it? Again, another question, I suppose, about the, our background knowledge about what um, search um, personalization, customization results normally do. Uh, uh, Tao wants to know at what level does localization appear to work? Country, state, suburb, location, thinking about implications for um, for particular race in particular in, in local areas. 
A very good question. Um, to be honest, at this point, we've only looked on a state-by-state -state basis. Um, in the demographic data that we capture, we ask for postcode. And of course, some people might then just say 4,000 or 2,000 or whatever to just give the state. Some people might be much more explicit and give the actual postcode of where they live or work. Um, so at the moment, we've just aggregated that by, by state. Um, but clearly, we can, with that data, also then, then look further and, and, and try and distinguish, say, the southeast Queensland region, region from, from far north Queensland or whatever, obviously with the limitation of how many actual users we have in any of these regions. At some point, of course, if you break it down too far, you'll end up with you know, two or three users who are basically all of north Queensland. And, uh, and then we can't make any reliable you know, uh, judgments from that kind of data anymore. So, but yeah, I think some of the further breakdown into uh, smaller areas, smaller than states, would be very useful if we can do it you know, realistically with the, with the kind of data that we have. Matthias, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, definitely, because this was something that we were discussing quite inten uh, intensively when we did our first data donation project, because the, the question was, you know, what, what kind of personalization are we talking about? What kind of uh, demographics are we talking about? And in, you know, a place like Europe, for example, um, I wouldn't go uh, as far as saying uh, it, it could be a proxy for race, but in some sense of ethnic ethnicity, that is definitely uh, a case and, an, um, and a probability, because if you have a more, let's say, international search that you're talking about, a, a certain person's name or something like that, and then um, it is um, the, the personalization is based on the geographic location, and that is Serbia in uh, contrast to Bosnia Herzegovina, you know, something like that. Then uh, this becomes a very, very interesting question. Um, and um, we didn't do that experiment, we didn't uh, run this, but this is something that uh, is certainly, um, yeah, something that, that needs to be explored more um, in, in areas of the world where um, this, this can play a very big role. I think time for the last one, which is from Dan, but I think it's a shared question. How do we encourage uh, broader take up of participation in these kinds of data donation citizen science projects and uh, where do we scale up these kinds of, of efforts perhaps? That's always the challenge I think you can build it but they won't necessarily come um, in the first place they need to find out about it which is why we've done a lot of media and community outreach already but we will very much continue to do so obviously um, we have we will have this plugin in the field for a year in total so until mid next year and uh, all through that time, I'm hoping to do further outreach, um, make this really visible as, an, as a project on an ongoing basis. Of course, as we're getting results now as well, we'll do follow-up media work as well and, and reach out uh, to community groups as well to really try and make these results visible and, and thereby hopefully also generate some further take-up. But uh, that, is, that is the big challenge and that's where Matthias, you talked about this idea of perhaps having a, a regular established panel that, that could participate, that's representative ideally. Um, of course, that would also be great to have for these kinds of projects. Yeah, I can only add to that, that uh, this is the um, challenge that we are facing all the time. And at the same time, it's one of these very good reasons why we say there needs to be more direct access to platforms data, right? Because uh, we can only always do so much. And I think the experience, I, in the, the one in Australia seems to be really success, successful in the sense of the number of data donors compared to the population. So congratulations on that. That's pretty cool. Um, but again, you know, um, this is not this is not sufficient, um, and we need uh, um, other kinds of access. Well, I think, um, as Mother Abigail says in Stephen King's epic plague novel, The Stand, there's a storm coming. Uh, so I think we have to wrap up. I cannot remember if I meant to say anything else in particular, Cathy, except to thank all of our participants in the day, both here and abroad. We have thank another you. session. Thank you. Do we? Yeah. Oh, I'm not supposed to do anything. I'm actually running the next session, so you can just hand over to me if you like. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so thank you for your attention to this fabulous panel. Please thank our speakers. I'll hand over to Axel. <laughs>
Hey, everyone. Oh. Thank you, Matthias. Thank Thanks you, so Matthias. much.